My name is Timmy Tokwe, Praising Child, and we're, be, we're going to be talking about new parents today. And we have four amazing speakers who are going to be um, talking to us about new parents, their experience, um, the lessons they've learned. And before we go into their sessions, I would be sharing a PowerPoint slide briefly about new parents, um, just to have some meat on the matter. Um, and then I'll introduce our speakers and we'll go right into business. Okay, so we're having Find the Link Parenting. We had the first session last week and it was really great. And it was about um, preparing for parenthood. And we had three speakers and they really spoke really well on the topic. Um, and it should be on YouTube very soon. If not by the end of today, it should be on there by tomorrow. Um, and the aim is to empower, inspire and enlighten parents as they raise change makers and godly leaders. So we're talking new parents. So just brief definitions, purpose of new parents, expectations, needs, and um, your parts. I, I didn't get into your parts, but I'm sure the other speakers would be talking about how they got help from other people. So new parents, they're new to the role. Um, they're new to the experience. They're new to the child. Um, sure all of us know that children come with their own different characteristics and characters. So some are new to the role of parenting. So it's the first time they're having to take responsibility for another human being, a very little vulnerable one at this point. Um, others are new to the process, the process of childbirth, pregnancy, adoption, or even just childcare. So they've been parents before, and maybe they have to take over their child's child. So at the point where they're supposed to be grandparents, they're actually now in a new role taking care of a child. So that's what I mean, new to the experience again. Um, and when I say new to the child, it can be a new child that has come into your life as a first child, a second, or others, or a foster child, an adopted child, or into your life as a new grandchild. So the purpose for new parents would be to care, to nurture, to provide, to protect, to discipline, to guide. I'm sure the list um, is longer than this. Um, expectations of new parents. They have expectations of themselves. They expect to be healthy, to be stable, to be happy um, in their new role and in the new experience. They expect to be competent, to be able to handle this. Um, they expect to be able to take on these new challenges. Um, they have expectations of the child as well. So it's not quite without expectations. Um, they expect the child to grow, to be healthy, to be happy, to be normal, well, normal relative to other children and to be appreciative. I think these are general expectations. There might be more. I know some parents actually expect their children to pay back their school fees. I've met some parents like that. Um, but yes, these are general expectations. How often do we or others meet these expectations? That is a different question altogether um, because it is completely new terrain and sometimes things do not turn out as planned. Um, sometimes not at all. So the needs for new parents, they need knowledge, definitely, and they need ongoing support. So it's not like a one-off. So this platform, for instance, will be a form of support for new parents that are getting into um, the role of a new parent or are experiencing this all over again. And the support could be emotional, financial, psychological, material, even something as basic as telling a new parent that you're doing well, it's okay. Um, new parents most of the time can be very nervous and anxious and can feel um, insecure. They can feel that they are not, they have feelings of inadequacy sometimes about having to handle these new human beings. So they do need love, they need support, they need rest, they need breaks, they need money because sometimes the expenses that they plan for, um, it goes way beyond what they planned for. That's for the ones that have actually taken time to plan. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about that last week when we were talking about planning 
for parenthood and it was um, expounded on quite well. So more to come. We have four amazing speakers. They're going to talk about the experiences, the lessons they've learned as new parents. Please feel free to ask questions, make comments um, in the chat box. Um, for instance, if your area is quite busy, feel free to make um, a comment in the chat box or ask a question there. Your feedback is highly appreciated. There are 10 more Zoom sessions on parenting. The replays will be on YouTube. Check things off our present child on there. And um, we do have an active online platform on parenting. It's on WhatsApp. It's become quite active in the last couple of days, what was opened over the past week. Um, there's a form to fill. They're going to need intros and participation on the group from time to time. For feedback or questions, you can send me an email as well, which is thingsofwebpresentchild at gmail.com. Thank you for your kind attention and our slogan for our parenting Find the Link series is I and the children God has given me, we are for signs and wonders. And that is it from me. And I will just introduce the speakers to yourselves. So going first, we would have Busola Ajao. Um, she is a lady that I like a lot. I met her in church, choir. She's a sister to me right now. Um, she has lots of experience in the world of finance and she is mother to two lovely children and she will be going first sharing her experiences with us um, and she will be followed by Pastor Kende Akinbadi who I've known well for over two decades, um, a gentleman who is a great speaker and a pastor, um, founding pastor of the Right Way Revival Commission um, and he would be talking to us from his viewpoint being a clergyman and his experience as a new parent. And then after that, we will be listening to Dr. Shola Fatola, who is a general practitioner based in Manchester, the big city of Manchester, where she lives with her family, nuclear and extended. Um, she has two great children, who I happen to have seen this afternoon, speaking the lingua franca of the homeland. Um, she's a great friend and she's also been my classmate back in medical school. And last but not the least is Dr. Sheon Durojaye, who is a general practitioner based in Newcastle. Um, she has a, she's had a bit of a busy life with two children who happen to be twins, and she'll be sharing with us from her spectacular experience. Um, handling them as a new parent. And I'm sure they have lots to share with us. So please sit back, be comfortable. Um, and I'm sure we would have questions and comments from their sections. So um, I would just highlight them. So I would just spotlight Busala Mia in the spotlight, Busala. Calling you so long, but yes, fine. Sure you, sure you don't mind. <laughs> okay, over to you, Busola. Thank you very much. Okay, hello everyone. Um, good afternoon. I have a bit of a cold, so please, if I'm sounding funny, just excuse me. Um, so basically, I I'm only here to share my experience. So you know. I'm just putting that caveat out there. I'm not teaching. I'm not, you know, pretending to be some kind of expert in anything. I'm just telling you what happened to me. Um, all right. So first of all, um, I'd like to talk about the physical tour that the, the experience of giving birth had on me. Um, to prepare, you know, you read up, uh, maybe for those of us who are not in the medical line, or I don't know, you read, you see some videos, you talk to people, but nothing. And I mean, nothing, nothing even scratched the surface of what I experienced. Um, the labor was, I, 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 in fact, I, I just went for a normal check and the doctor said, oh, you know, you're having contractions. Oh, you're having contractions. Oh, these contractions are strong. You know what, just stay behind and have this baby right away. Oh, okay. And then he said, oh, he was gonna, he was gonna facilitate the labor. 
at the time I did not know what that meant. I had been warned about induction. So I knew that if they said they are going to induce me wrong, but when he said it will give me something to facilitate the labor, that sounded like something different. So I said, yes, <laughs> I entered my own special hell. It was awesome. I, I, I think my, my first, in fact, my takeaway from it is they need to tell people that at a point you will feel like everything has gone wrong, but it's still part of the process. Like you will actually feel like, no, no, no. Yes, there's pain and there's all, but no, at, at this point, I, I think, no, no, something has gone very wrong. And we need to know before, if I had known beforehand, like when I had my second child, I was a lot calmer because I knew that those feelings came with the first one. And it didn't mean that there was something, or it's just a feeling and maybe it's your body's reaction to the pain, I don't know, but it was, it was not good because that brought a lot of trauma, a lot of fear, a lot of, oh, wow. Well, um, you know, and then when the baby came out eventually, they had tried, um, they had tried forceps, they tried the, there's this thing, I, I want to call it a plunger, I don't know, Dr. Yeah, Ventus, yes. Function. Yes, she tried it. Now, once it didn't work, she was just stuck right there. And I don't know how it happened. At some point, I fell asleep and I just woke up and I need to push, I need to push, push, push. And I pushed, and the baby came out. You know, others will tell you that I was not asleep, that I was dead. I don't know. All I know is that when the baby came out, she was already, she was practically gray and not crying she was just making this sound so they started working on her hurriedly and all of that and she started crying and then everything you know became a, a bit more normal so it's a roller coaster of emotions for me it was just one second up one second down what's going on what's going on um but then getting the baby to take home and that was it was a vaginal birth at the end of the day so um, the, it was it was somewhat easier in the sense that I could move around and I could take my baby home the very next day. But the problem was that I had tear, I had a tear, oh, well, I was cut. So they sewed, they sewed me up. And when I got home, I just felt like, sorry, you know, this is too much information, but it felt like there was still a needle right down there poking me and prodding me and I just needed, I went back to the hospital to say, something is wrong. Can you guys check down there what's going on? And they, the doctor said, no, there's nothing wrong. It's, it's the way it's supposed to be. We, we sewed you up, you're fine. I said, okay, can you give me something for the pain? Give me something because I'm really in a lot of pain. And he said, this is five days after the birth. I was in terrible pain. And he says, oh yeah, there's really nothing we can give you except paracetamol because you're breastfeeding. And I was like, what? He says, yeah, it's, we can only give you paracetamol if you, if you take it. And of course I wasn't going to say no, but I remember he gave me an injection. I didn't even know when I got the injection because I didn't feel it. I was in so much pain that the injection didn't register. This is me that all my life I've been running from injection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't even notice when they gave me the, the injection. You know, so those first few days was a lot of pain, a lot, a lot, a lot of pain. Um, I spent a, 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 at the time I was with my mother-in-law, we had to move just like two or three weeks before I put to bed. So I, I was, I told my husband then I wasn't even, I wasn't ready to start looking for a house. Let's just stay with, you know, with your mom, have the baby and then we'll move on from there. You know, so at the time I was my mother-in-law and she was very helpful. Um, and my sister-in-law, they, they practically did everything. Bathing the baby, everything, all I had to do was breastfeed. So I had a lot of support, a lot, a lot, a lot of support. They would feed, do food, do everything. All I had to do was just breastfeed the baby, breastfeed the baby. And I can't tell you how helpful that was. It made so much difference to me because I... I mean, I, I was not in the frame of mind to do anything for myself, to talk less of do anything for anybody else or, you know, it helped that I wasn't working, I wasn't going anywhere, I just stayed at home and, you know, had the chance to heal 
and to get acquainted with the baby. Um, another thing was sleep. Sleep was like this really precious commodity that you know, you're ready to sell anything to, to get sleep. But I thank God, I will never forget, there was a particular night that the baby was crying and I woke up, my husband, wake up, wake up. And he woke up, he jumped up, carried the baby and was pacing madly, pacing madly. Shh, shh, shh. Then he looked at me and he said, honey, whose baby is this? As in, he, he, he was, you know, when you are sleep deprived, you no, know, it, was, it was a special time. You know, I, I don't think people know enough about what those days can be like, but I, I thank God because, you know, at the end of the day, everything normalized, the baby was fine, you know, and our lives got a lot more stable that we could, um, we could, um, we could cope better. The last thing I wanted to talk about is how, um, on the spiritual side of things, you know, um, I had prayed about my child and you know, received certain words and you know, certain promises from God about the child. And something that happened, one of the things that happened was I noticed that this child, um, how do I put this now? Like there was a communication in a way. Um, I will never forget, there was a particular night she was crying in the middle of the night and crying, you know, this middle of the night cry that everybody, nobody can sleep and all. But at some point I, I handed over to my husband and I don't know how I slept off. And in that dream, I saw that she was crying because there was a there was an evil presence around the house. And the person was trying to come around the back. And in the dream, we, I got an instruction, sing this particular song. I, I can never forget. It was, um, thank you, Jesus, the honor of my soul. Alpha Omega, you are. And you know, in the dream, that was what, and in the dream, we started singing and you know, the Holy Spirit chased the evil presence away. All of this happened within like 20 minutes. I woke up and I told my house, she was still crying. Everything was exactly the way it was before. I but I was like, oh, whoa, whoa, this is what we need to do. We need to sing this song. We need to praise God. And, and that was what we did, you know? So um, in my experience, I, I will never take for granted the spiritual side of things, how even at that tender age, you know, God still used that child to communicate to me. So um, yeah, I think those are, I think I've used up all my time. And I was okay. Do you still have anything to add? Oh, there are many. There are so many. It's just, you know, um, money, money, um, planning. One, one other area was uh, finances. And I disagreed with my husband about this because I'm more of a planner. Maybe it's a finance thing in me. Let us have the budget. This is how much we're going to spend on clothes. This is how much we're going to spend on food. This is how much we're going to spend on our household expenses aside from the baby coming in and all, you know? And he was more like, what are you talking about? She's the first grandchild. Do you know the kind of things that people are sending to us? Do you know? And maybe because, you know, I, I don't have that mindset. For me, I want to do what I want to do. I'm not going to be relying on somebody else, no matter, you know, maybe because it's his family, because apparently he's, he's the firstborn of a firstborn. So you see, family, they were, uh, he wasn't lying. When I saw <laughs> things, I was confused. He, he told me she will have clothes to wear till she's five. And he, he wasn't exaggerating. She has things that till now, she has not won, till now. But at the time, <laughs> it was not funny because I couldn't see those things. I don't know those people. And all I'm saying is let's plan. So it caused a lot of friction between me and him. You know, it caused a lot of friction. I felt he was not listening to me. He was not planning, but he felt I was being unnecessarily quarrelsome because those things are sorted. So, you know, I would just say people should communicate better. Planning is always going to be my number one plan. <laughs> plan for your for your baby, finances, everything. Like, so I had detailed lists, everything from bottles, number of bottles by size. Yeah, I knew how many bottles I wanted the purifier. I knew the kind of, um, how do you, what do you call it, breast pump. I wanted, you know, and it, it, it made me calmer. It made me calmer. It helped up till the experience of giving birth. I was a very calm person, but the pain 
brought out a different side of me. But then after that, I was a lot better again. So yeah, the anxiety of having a baby and just worrying that something will go wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything can take that away. It's just resting in God and knowing that that was what worked for me because that voice will keep telling you, hmm, you just roll over and squash this baby. Oh, did you read in the Bible? This one happened, that one happened. Oh, somebody baby can just fall down. And I just kept saying, it's not my portion. God gave me this child. What he gives, he doesn't add sorrow with it, you know? And I just kept making those affirmations. And it, because if not, those thoughts can actually drive one crazy. I've never, I've never seen anybody who had a baby. I wasn't scared that they were going to do something that would damage that child. So it's something to also watch out for and plan against. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been amazing hearing your story. Thank you so much for sharing. I know some parts of it might have scared some people, but I think a lot of it would have given people hope and information <laughs> that they would find useful for themselves and for others. So thank you so much. Um, we'll be going to Pastor Kende now. Thank you. Hello, Pastor Kende. You're muted. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> my name is Pastor Kende Akimbade. My experience as a new parent is exciting and at the same time very, very challenging. There is a great excitement in my spirit that at least I'm, I'm going to become a father. And uh, anywhere I go, I announce to people very soon I will be a father. <laughs> And the day my wife delivered her first baby, I actually can't explain the feeling I had that day. I was announcing to everybody I met in the hospital, the one I know, the one I don't know, that please rejoice with me, I've become a father. My wife had put to bed, I'm a father. I remember when the nurse was even asking for the father of the child. I won't forget the statement I made that I said, <laughs> so it was quite exciting. And I, but I think the challenge of being a new parent come with that excitement. The excitement of expecting a baby does not actually make us to prepare for the act of parenting. We forgot completely that we have to prepare for this act of parenting, but the excitement of the expectation take that away from us. So actually when the baby came, the challenge arose. What was the first challenge? The first challenge is too many instructors with conflicting instruction on how to raise the child. When we cover the child, somebody will come and say, it is not proper for you to cover the child. <laughs> so we uncover. Another person will come and see us uncover the child and say, no, it is not proper. We have to cover the child. At a point, <laughs> me and my wife became confused because we don't know what to do. But I think the reason for this is we did not have this type of, of, of opportunity we are having on find the link parenting to understand the act of parenting. The expectation, the excitement of expectation took that away from us. And because we did not actually prepare for the act of parenting, there are times the baby will be having some kind of problem that just little thing we need to do to get it solved. Since we don't have the knowledge we, we begin to bind and loose, and our binding and loosing was not making any effect. The baby, we keep crying, <laughs> we, we are praying, we attribute it to one demon somewhere until we realize that it was this, um, I don't know, nervous issue that is disturbing the, the baby. So just warm water, somebody advised us to be placing warm, um, warm water on the, on the nave. And when we did that, whenever he's crying in the night, we discovered the baby sleep well. So we, now we realize it was, it was not a matter of, of demon. It is ignorance of what 
not know what to do at a particular point in time. So it was a great challenge to us. I remember there was a night that my baby was crying. Uh, we don't know what to do. We did all we know how to do, and he wouldn't just stop crying in the night. We pray, we lay hand, not even lay hand, we carry a whole Bible place on him so that that would bring a comfort. But lo and behold, no result. So my wife carried the baby and was crying. So as a man in the house, I was controlling myself because it is not good for me to be crying in front of my, of my wife. So when my wife exhaust, exhausted herself on what he should do, she gave the baby to me. And lo and behold, the cry continued. I didn't know the time I joined the crying too, begging God to <laughs> begging God to have mercy. <laughs> At the end of the day, we thank God the baby slept and uh, were able to, to sleep. So challenge of many not preparing well for the act of parenting really affected us so much as a new parent. And as I've said, the challenge of many instructor with conflicting instruction is another issue we have to face. But thank God, we're able to sort it out, get an elderly person who is a medical person. And I say, my wife, no matter what anybody tell us, we are not going to follow them. Let us follow this woman. After all, he raised, he, he raised more than seven children and he's a grandmother. He has raised many grandchildren. If her children didn't die, then let us follow her. When we follow her instruction, our own child too will live by following her instruction. As Bible said, mark the step of a righteous man when the end of such man is peace. And since we learned that one, I think we follow her instruction and everything ended up in peace for us. And another challenge that I can vividly remember and that has to do with me as a, as a person, was before we got the baby, I always get the attention of my wife, 247. We are always together. And if there's anything I enjoy so much, is that attention. When I sleep, she lay a hand on me. I feel a hand on my body. At least even if I don't feel a hand on me, I won't be able to sleep. We are, so, we are that close. If I sit down, I want her to sit by my side. Now, baby has come. And suddenly, I discover that the attention I was getting from her, I could no longer get the attention. It may look like a small thing, but it really disturbed me that at the time I felt hope I'm not going to rifle with my, with my baby because she's taking much of her attention. And uh, I'm made to feel so lonely in the house of three people. Because if he's not attending to, to the baby by breastfeeding, she will be doing other things like cleaning or washing the clothes. So it became an issue that at times I begin to feel somehow and I was getting irritated in the house. I said, Lord, this thing cannot continue like this. After all, the baby is my baby. And my wife is attending to my baby. But nevertheless, I need her attention too because it's affecting me. So what do I do? I, I went to a father in the Lord, Reverend Sambola Epimoyen. I said, Daddy, I want to share something with you. It may look so simple, but it's a, it's a big challenge to me. And he said, what is it? I said, since my baby arrived, I have not been able to get the attention of my wife the way I used to get it. And the thing is affecting me. And I don't want to speak to my, I don't want to talk to my wife so that he will not see me as being in, in rivalry with the newborn baby, which will not be healthy. And uh, my father in the Lord said, that couldn't have, that is a problem actually, that there's a solution. And I said, sir, what is the solution? He said, go and identify those areas that your wife is giving much attention to your baby and take responsibility of those things. So I got home, 
the first thing I did was to make sure that the what the all the washing of this thing when he needed to wash, I would go and join her in the washing so that we can finish on time. So at least we finish on time. I will have the remaining time to myself. So I was trying to save time for her in order to be able to give that time to me uh, as an attention. And uh, I remember another thing that the team when you told me was, whenever the baby, I should always allow the baby to be with me all the time. Since it is the baby that is taking the attention of my, of my wife. So if I have the baby with me, then <laughs> there is no way he will pay attention to the baby without paying attention to <laughs> ah. Can you imagine? We cannot lose this hostage store. <laughs> Somebody has put in the comment section, Ogbanda, <laughs> the wisdom of the of the sages. <laughs> we cannot do. We are really enjoying the gist. <laughs> I don't know what else. It's in your sense. Thank you, Sister Sophie. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether. Um, I don't think he's able to, we'll just see whether, we'll just see whether Pastor Kende is able to um, pop back into the room so that he can complete his talk. Um, but I, I, I'm hoping that we are taking notes and we're learning a lot from this session. Someone has written there that he likes the authenticity. Thank you. So I've, I've, I've picked points from both speakers and it has raised some questions, um, like the first speaker talking a lot about um, the value of sleep and how it is important to be prepared for crying. Um, children do cry a lot and about staying in the word. Have you received any word from God about your children? Have you sought God about your children? Um, and then um, Pastor Kendi has raised some points about many instructors, um, the shifting of attention. So that is something that spouses should probably be prepared for um, because you would not, um, you would probably not know. Uh, well, there are some things he's saying that are kind of new to me about, I know it's loneliness is very, very common in our world, but I think it might be the first time I'm hearing someone come out and say a man is feeling lonely because his wife has, diverted all attention to the children. And I think the, the words of advice he, he, he received um, can be used by a lot of us in the future, or we can share it with others as well who would benefit. Um, taking responsibility, those were really great points as well. Um, someone has said very interesting and useful tips. Another person said, I am glad he opened up as with men, ego is always a barrier. <laughs> I think ego is a barrier to healthy relationships in every sector, whether in the workplace or in the home. Um, so I think I would go to our next speaker, actually. Um, at the end of the session, I'll just put all the speakers together and they'll give us their final words or tell us what was the most important lesson, the final words for the house about being a new parent. So you might want to start getting that together as well. But if Pastor Kedi hasn't popped back into the house by now, I think we will just move on to the next speaker. And we have Dr. Ulua Shola Christiana Fatola. And I will put her in the spotlight now. Okay, over to you, Shali. Okay, hi everyone. Mm -hmm. um, good to see faces and some of us that have our cameras off. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll be talking about my own journey, but what I've done, um, thanks to the um, earlier speakers, um, great and useful tips as well. So what I've done is um, I've um, put different things together and I'll be sharing my experiences in between. So 
Definitely, we know a parent is simply someone's um, father or mother. So it's a position of responsibility, like I always call it. And there are different ways we could prepare or develop ourselves to take up this responsibility. So I'll share some of them because it's a journey you can go to without some information, without knowledge, without support. But again, nothing beats the experience. So you may read all the book, like Busola said, you may read all the book in the world, but the experience is different. But reading books and being knowledgeable about the process makes things better. Um, so um, a few things I'll share is, first of all, reading books is very important. If you don't like reading books, listen to audio book, audio books. When we have the child, so um, um, I'd already, once I tested, and I, once I did my pregnancy test and I was positive, I registered into, um, um, what do you call it? Um, my favorite, what does it tell me? Remind me, baby center. I cannot <laughs> talk without my parental journey without that app. That's a fantastic, so when I registered a few years ago, it wasn't an app, so um, it was simply registration baby center. And baby center is so, so wonderful. I will encourage anybody who is expecting or even anybody who is pregnant or anybody looking into, even at this age. So what baby center does is it gives a detailed account of your child, about your child's development in the womb and outside the womb, even till date. And this is a weekly detailed account. And it also gives you recommendation as a mom, your life right now, what should you be doing right now? What are the important stages of your life? Are you supposed to be having your health check? Is your child supposed to be having an health check? So the reason why I love this baby center was in the womb when I was having the children, it tells me, oh, at this X and Y weeks, the eyes are forming, the ears are forming. And as a Christian, come on, everything you pray about. So when I hear eyes are forming, I begin to speak into those eyes. So it was a detailed, it just, I wasn't praying like, I'm, I'm, I wasn't praying vaguely for my child. For every week, I had a specific prayer point. There were organs in the body. There were things I was targeting. So it was like targeted prayer. And that really, really worked well for me. And because they were giving me detailed things that you should be doing, what, and when the child is growing, okay, at one month, this is what you should be doing. At two months, this is what you should be doing. So it really, really worked well for me. And I will encourage everybody to get, even till now, I'm still getting weekly updates. What you should be doing as a mom, what the child should be doing, how you can support the child. So it's really, really a fantastic. But recently, I checked again, and it's become an app. So if you want to um, download the app, that would be very great. Um, so secondly, so that's about books. Read books, listen to books. You can't do anything without information. Knowledge is power. Information is key. And it just helps things get, get better. Now, Baby Center will tell you that there's no pressure. Not all children attain their development at the same time. So you see a friend's child, your children are one week apart and she started talking and she started walking. And so you feel your child should be the same. No, that, that's not it because children develop differently. Some are early and some are late. So um, that's it about the baby center. Secondly, attend meetings. So when you, before you're having the child or once you have the child, if there's any antenatal clinic, please go. There you get information, people share experiences, people talk, take opportunities. Now, when I, when I was pregnant, they offered swimming classes. I was the only black person there. Um, one thing I've I I'm realized so, in this set of- I'm sorry, this, one minute. I'm going to mute you. Please unmute yourself again. Yeah, unmute yourself again, please. Okay, thank you. So one thing I realized was that all those opportunities that I was taken, to me, they were freebies, but it was just time for me to meet other new moms. It was time for me to interact. And I saw that I was the only black person jumping from one place to the other. And it's just because people don't realize that all these things, they do matter. They help you to relax. They help you to share experiences. They help you to meet with other, um, other new moms and then to make you realize that you are not alone. So lots of opportunities that you're being offered at natal clinic, play groups, baby play groups. They are nice places to go to as well, you know, get the support. Number three is meeting up with other new moms. So if you feel that, oh, okay, I have somebody else that I met and um, I can't make this big baby play group. It could just be the two of you, have coffee time, 
have play dates, invite each other to, to your house. Okay, um, bring your child and then I'll bring my child. Because all these things, they reassure you that you are not alone. Then you can share experiences. You can say, oh, my baby has started doing this or, you know, because parenthood is a journey that you don't have all the boxes. You don't have all the experience. You don't like um, Pastor said, and you have different instructors coming and you're not sure which one to get. But again, as time goes on, it gets better. And then you're gonna see what works for you and your baby and your family, which is very important. And um, another thing I'm going to go to, like Busola rightly said, support. This is not a journey you can go into without support. Accept help. People, if people offer to help or, and say, oh, I can, ha have a, I can have your baby for an hour and then you can do whatever you want to do. Please accept it. I understand that it's a strong bond between a new parent and a child, and you don't want to leave the child. You don't want to get you, the child out of your side because you're scared that mm, if I'm not there, the child will be crying. If I'm not there, um, something might happen. If I'm not there, you know, all those insecurities and all those feelings. But to be honest, it's important that you accept this help because that's the only way you can re-energize, you can put your legs up, you can rest. It's a time to watch movies, it's a time to enjoy yourself. And like Pastor Rightly said, it's a time to even bond with your spouse. That's very, very important, okay? And whatever you are going through, because it's a roller coaster of emotions as well. The hormones are still working. If you feel you need to communicate with your partner or your husband saying, look, I need help with this thing, talk. Don't just say, you should know. They are just as new into the journey as you are. But the only difference is that women know how to multitask. One way or the other, we know how to figure out about five things in our brain than a man would. No disrespect to men. But if you feel that there's any challenging phase in your marriage or in your relationship at that time, you need help, you need support, please do. And please, um, always be ready to ask for help. Even if people are not offering, but you know that they can, always just take that time. Just ask, can you? The most you can get is a no. But by not asking, I think you are doing yourself a lot of injustice. So always ask for help. And then if there's any word of reassurance, parenthood gets better. Now, in the crying aspect, children can cry. But why do they cry? That is the only means of communication they understand. They are hungry, they cry. They want to eat, they cry. They have a wet nappy, they cry. So they want to sleep, they cry. So that crying is not demonic. Some of them, I will say, but don't get worked up by saying that she's always crying all the time. The reason why I said it gets better is as the children grow up and with the motherhood instinct, you'll be able to identify that. Somebody told me that, and until I actually observed it, there are different cries for each need. As time goes on, you will realize that uh, the way they warm up when they want to eat is different from the way they warm up when they, the way they start that cry when they are wet. So your motherhood instinct will definitely, definitely at one point in time get better. So never, never, never just say, oh, the child is crying and so I have to do something. Oh, the child is crying, I have to hold the child. Sometimes too much attention is even discomfort to the child. The child is crying, I have, needs hug. The child is crying, needs, you know, just relax, relax, just relax. And it does get better. And again, motherhood instinct, never let that out of the window. Most times it's always right. 90% of the time, look at what Busola said. Like when a, when a child was crying, 90% of the time, motherhood instinct is right. And I will always say, it is better to be reassured. Even if you think medically something is wrong with this child, take the child to the hospital. Don't listen to all those instructors. I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't listen, but sometimes you listen, but you know what your mind is telling you to do. So at that time, make sure you are, you are taking action. Your instinct is always right. And if you think that, oh, I'm not sure if my instinct is right, get reassurance from a professional because you may be wrong at the end of the day, but at least somebody is reassuring you. So the reassurance is better 
you get reassured for taking action, then something goes wrong and you get yourself to blame. And sometimes the healing process may be difficult. Some people are still blaming themselves still today. So you don't want to get yourself in that direction. Now, my last one is daily affirmation or Bible verse. I love it. Once you have that child, seek from God. Or if you're somebody like me sometimes, because sometimes I always say it's not everything that is spiritual. Open any Bible verse, take a word. And once you have that word, start speaking it into that child's life. As the child is growing, even if the child is a year or the child is few months, the child will be listening and you'll be so surprised that by the, child is, by the time the child is like a year or two, they'll be saying it after you. It may not be clear words, but they'll be saying it after you. Mine is mine for my children. Immediately I had, immediately I had the first one, maybe when it was nine months, immediately I had him, I just, I received um, um, Isaiah 61 to two. Arise, shine for the light has come. So till date, even if I'm not saying their morning prayer with them, I'm, I'm not saying their night prayer with them, they know it's their daily confession. We call it a daily confession. So they have to say their name, X, Y, Z, arise, shine for my light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon me. And these are the words that will grow up with them. And sometimes it could be affirmation. Another affirmation that I have for them um, is you can be the best you want to be, only you can do it better. And that's by, um, um, what's the name of the doctor that wrote Gifted Hands? Ben Carson. Ben Carson. So we watched the Ben Carson film together. You can do the best you can, only you can do it better. And so in almost in every place in my home. Now I've actually, sometimes I get, um, um, it depends on whatever they are going through. But again, we are talking about new mom, so we'll be discussing about this later. Sometimes depending on the challenges they are going through, I might change the word, I might change the affirmation, I might change the Bible verse, and then I, I put it, it's just pencil and paper or paper and pen. As led as I am, I stick it everywhere. If it's the kitchen, I stick it in the kitchen and they have to see it in the morning and they have to say it in the morning. So um, I hope with these few, few things um, I've been able to share, I'm sure that uh, you've um, let one, one thing or the other, but again, parenthood is a beautiful journey and it only gets better and it comes with its own challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shola. You've touched on so many great points. It's been amazing to hear you speak. Um, so you've touched on some major areas that I wrote down. Um, one was about reading books and getting knowledge. Um, you've mentioned the baby center, which I know you're very passionate about. Um, bonding um, with other people and getting support. Um, ask. Um, if you don't ask, the answer is automatically no. If you ask, you might actually get a yes. So it's good to ask. I love to ask. Um, and when I ask, I like to ask for more. Olivia Twist. Okay, communicate with your spouse. Um, communicate with other people. Very important. Nobody can really mind read. Some people do have a spirit of discernment, but not everybody. So please communicate. Um, perceptions, very, very important. Um, yes, I, I now remember why I wrote about perceptions. It's about the fact that children actually perceive their environment, even though they cannot speak. So children can pick up anxieties of their parents, the same way they can pick up positive vibes from their parents. So it's something to note that if you see a calm, confident mom, um, it's not likely that their children may be very, very finicky. But if you see a woman that is very, very anxious, like all the time, it's very likely her children are going to be reflecting it. They might be crying more. I actually spoke to a mother in Nigeria and she said, I think she had like five children or four. But she said there was one of them that used to cry a lot for no reason and that she had taken him to the hospital. He had seen different doctors and there was nothing wrong with him. And that till now, he's still the child that cries the most. Like you just, you just enter a room and just start to cry just for no reason. That's just his own, his own habits. His own habits is to cry. So she now knows that, well, that's just him and all children are different. And mothers and parents just start discerning their children's character as they grow with them. So it's not like automatic. Um, and I really like what she's mentioned about the instinct or the perception that you have about your child. So some mothers just know that something is just not right about this child. So for instance, because I'm also in medical practice, one of the things we tell mothers is that even if a mother comes in with a child and we see the child, child seems fine. 
and they say, I just wanted you to be sure it's not all in my head. You hear them say things like that. I wanted to be sure I'm doing the right thing. Many times they need reassurance, especially if they are first time moms. But in spite of reassuring them, children are such that things can change very quickly. So if something changes, we always tell them that if you notice this, if you notice that, or if you are concerned, meaning you are just uncomfortable with something you have seen about this child, then call for help again. We are happy to see the child again things like that, um, very, very important to do that. Um, thank you so much for that, Shola, that's um, great. And we are going to our next speaker, last but not the least. Um, and okay, Shola has touched on the spiritual aspect. My friend Shola is a prayer warrior. I'm learning to be a better prayer warrior from a very, very prayerful somebody. But prayer is very essential in the world we live in. I, can't, I cannot even say too much about it. Um, yes, yeah, so we are going to our next speaker. Last but not the least, um, she has a very exciting story to share, I'm sure. Um, Dr. Shinoduro Jai, over to you. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you very much, Kami, for having me on your platform and for inviting me to share my experience. Pleasure. And thank you to all the other previous speakers as well who have um, shared their Sobusola, Pastor, Kimbadi. And that happens to be my maiden name, actually. So I do wonder if we're somewhat <laughs> related. <laughs> and so a dear friend and colleague, uh, Shala Fatala, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. So um, where do I start from? Uh, the well, first and foremost, what? <laughs> the beginning? The beginning. <laughs> a good place to start. <laughs> well, I think Tammy gave me 15 minutes. So I'm just going to try to summarize as much as possible because even if she gave me 24 hours, and I'm sure most people here feel the same way, if you had 24 <laughs> hours, it wouldn't be enough. Um, I th first and foremost, I'm a relatively new parent. So I think the jury is still out on deciding how new is new. But I think with two and a half or three, I can still claim to be new. And I'm a mom of um, twin toddlers, so a boy and a girl. Right, so journey to parenthood. Um, I've been married, it'll be 12 years, this, 13 years this year. Yes, 13 years this year. So there was also a bit of a delay, just like she'll experience. Um, and I'm glad that she talked about IVF and the stigma associated with IVF. So she was one of the lucky few that got pregnant after first try. I wasn't. We went through cycle one, cycle two. And then cycle three, we got pregnant. So that was really good. And we're pleased and happy to find out that we expected twins. And everything went well as it could possibly go. <laughs> um, and you know when Shola was talking about the baby center? And now I didn't register for the baby center, but I had another app called, um, I need to check it out now. I don't remember the name, but it's still on my phone. But I stopped abruptly and I'll explain why I stopped. Right. So pregnancy for me was a pretty, was pretty uneventful from the medical aspect. Now, in terms of symptoms, I had really, really, really bad vomiting and I had killer migraines. So usually I, I, I tend to have migraines. But then when you're pregnant, they take you off your regular medication and they switch. And that switch just, it just wasn't good for me. So I didn't really enjoy the pregnancy period. But outside of that, you know, like medically, where we go for scans, everything was fine. And then I remember... And uh, whilst I was pregnant, I was in my second trimester, I was about 22 weeks. I went to Nigeria, came back. I had a trip planned to Israel, which would have been around 27 weeks. I already was planning to get my letter from a GP. My class had a reunion and I can see a few of my classmates here. So I, I, I followed somebody from Durham all the way to rugby <laughs> for party on the weekend, slept there, came back. And that was my last free weekend before my life changed you know, drastically. Um, I was at work, I was 23 weeks pregnant at the time, so still second trimester. Um, and then I was at work on a Friday, I was on call. And I just, had, I just suddenly started feeling this odd, you know, low abdominal pain, so. I thought, ah, okay, now I was, I was at work, I was going to finish at six, and then I had another shift to start at midnight. Why I was working so hard while I was pregnant, I don't know, but I honestly just felt I could continue. I didn't feel, even though I felt a bit sick, it wasn't like the work was overwhelming, it was work I had been doing, and I really enjoyed, so why not? Um, anyway, to cut the long story short, I decided to get checked in, got into hospital, I was told I was in labor at 23 weeks and five days, I was like, what? They were like, yes, you're one to two centimeters dilated, and I thought that cannot be possible so I called a few friends called um, a mentor and we started praying went in and out of labor ward back to the room back to labor ward eventually when I was 24 weeks pregnant and two days I delivered the twins so one of them was just 
630 grams and the other one was just 510 grams. So think of it as really tiny, really about the size of an iPhone, smaller than a bottle of Coke. And thus began the very long journey of parenting. So when I said I stopped that app, it was because it was causing me trauma, right? Because they'll be telling you that your baby should be the size of your so and so. I'm like, sorry, my babies are out there already in the incubators. I don't need this. I had to cut all of that out. Um, and so, yeah, so my experience and journey into parenting and parenthood um, was not conventional. Uh, and it has been as different as different can be in every single ramification. And I, honestly do not have the time to begin to share how completely different it is from everybody's you know so when Shola was sharing about not um comparing milestones and not comparing things in fact nobody had to tell you 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 yourself after yourself you old, as we say in my part of the country you give yourself brain you just decide that Sean has left this chat when people are talking about this because I'm sorry I can't relate that hasn't been my journey that hasn't been how you know God has chosen for me to walk this path um so Right, so that's just a bit of a background as to as to explain why I say the things I say and from my own perspective. So the children were born and almost every health challenge you can imagine we went through. A few people here are medics, so you sort of know the things that would be expected. I mean, I'm not going to go into details of diagnoses and surgeries and procedures and no, no there's no need for that. But just to give you an idea, one of them was in hospital for three and a half months and the other one was in hospital for nearly seven months. So you can imagine, like, if you had a normal delivery in the UK and everything goes smoothly, maybe you had an episiotomy, that's, that's like they cut you up to let the baby come out. Um, then you're home in two days. If you have the surgery, maybe in three to five days. Imagine the trauma of going into hospital every single day. Now, um, I was first on admission for about a week, but then because I didn't even have a C-section, after about two weeks, about um, after a week, actually, I was free to go. Um, but thankfully, my children were, were in a tertiary center, which was where I registered. So it was like the regional center. So they could actually deal with very, very sick, small babies. And thankfully, I, I lived quite close to the hospital. So it wasn't too bad for me because I could drive 10 minutes from my house and I was at the NICU. That's the neonatal um, ICU. I know some other people that we shared a bay and we were in the hospital because the hospital only took very sick as children. We're driving two hours. In fact, somebody that I met that had a set of twins a day after me, they didn't have space for both her 24 weeks in the hospital. One of them was in James Cook, which was in two hours away. I imagine having one twin in one hospital and that's in another hospital and the trauma of that. So that's just to let you have a bit of an idea of how um, rough, as it were, the beginning of that whole journey was of waking up every single day. So after I was discharged, every single day, my only job was to wake up, get dressed at seven, uh, usually by like 9, 30, 10, I'm at the hospital. Um, and my babies were in, in unital ICU. There were four beds there. Me alone, I had two of the beds. <laughs> I think, whoa, I one one in, on the left and one on the right, and then other babies, two other babies in the four bedded unit. <laughs> And for you to know how sick and tiny they were, they both had an allocated nurse, as in those children, as in somebody will come to work and resume at 7 a.m. in the morning and her only job was to look after um, a baby one. And another person's only job was to look after baby two. And after 12 hours, they will switch. And another night for about almost two months, it was they were that sick. Eventually, they got better. So one of them could have one nurse to two children you know so um in terms of things like mental health now i'm big on mental health for that i remember then they offered you on the ward mental health support and i was like no i'm fine i've got friends i've got church da, 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 da. i remember when they just got to the hospital and i don't even know what happened that day. i don't know what triggered me. i just broke down and asked for the mental health counselor you know so that was, so that was really good so i'll just like to encourage anybody you know who as a new parent, if you're feeling overwhelmed, now obviously your story might not be as quite as eventful or as colorful as mine has been, but it's still really overwhelming to have a little tiny child, you know, depend on you for everything. And I completely understand what the other speakers had said about babies crying. Um, now I'm back at work part-time and many times, if you're getting a call from a concerned mother at five um, of a five-week-old, six-week-old, seven-week-old at about 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m., it's usually the baby is crying. We don't know what to do. When you ask the question, is this your first child or second child? Most likely it's the first child. And many times I just tell them, come, 
okay fine it's most likely it's not anything you know bring the child and let's have a look usually by the time they get the child into the cassette and into the utc <laughs> the baby has slept but i completely understand that whole trauma of babies crying so if you're feeling overwhelmed you feel like this is a bit much and if you are offered help so i'm fortunate to have delivered the babies and to have and to live in a country where they offer you that sort of thing if, if you are in that, in that sort of situation but you can always ask for help or ask for support um, so I'm big on mental health, you know, postpartum blues, um, feeling a bit low, just generally feel like I can't do this by myself. The second thing I'd like to say, people ask me how I got through that is a whole lot of support. And that's something I'm really glad that a lot of the other speakers have touched on. Um, support, in, in fact, can I begin to count for a whole year? I didn't buy diapers. I had people supplying diapers to my homes, uh, to my home wipes people just come i remember two classmates drove all the way from london just to sit with me they were babies were so sick i couldn't even let them get into the new team me and myself i was injured i was crying so they just sat with me for about one hour at costa downstairs in the hospital and then drove back you know um, i had people praying for me now i'm a christian and i'm practicing one at that so a few of the things i would say will lean towards that so apologies if anyone in the audience uh, has a different religion but i do believe in prayers and prophecy and that. And I feel like that was one of the things that, you know, really helped. Um, I had a lot of support from the health professionals as, as well, breastfeeding nurses. So in terms of things like food and feeding, you all have all these expectations in your mind, you know, of what pregnancy and, you know, natal period and, you know, infancy and toddlers will be. All I would say is relax and be flexible. I had to relax and be flexible. Um, I hadn't completely decided on breastfeeding both children because I just wasn't sure I'd be able to cope. But then when I had the children, you know, so I just called me and said, look, the best thing for their gut that hasn't developed properly is breast milk. So, you know, we had breastfeeding nurses who gave me like massive hospital pumps. I had one in the hospital and one at home and I was just expressing milk like a cow. We had to buy an extra freezer tall one like seven drawers full of express milk and they had to, that till they were here. Now, some people will say, ah, I'd rather they were having it from source. I don't want to give them bottle. Brother, sister, please <laughs> do not harm yourself or kill yourself. You need the support. And for me, at a point, I had one child had been discharged after about four months and another one was still in hospital. So I, I still had to keep going. And the one at home had to eat now. So thank God for the express milk. They were putting it inside bottle and feeding the child in my absence, you know. So be a bit more flexible. Even when women started, now one of them had so many things that she could eat and couldn't eat. And the other one could eat everything. I don't know how. And now this is funny. My husband is Nigerian. He's from Oyo State. They eat, um, Amala, me, um, Ekiti, originally, <laughs> it parted, yeah. The children did not accept Amala, did not accept the way do did not accept Eba. I'm not joking. My mother-in-law would say, what kind of children are these? At the end of the day, they eat salmon, they eat mash, but anything that they eat so that you can sleep and rest. Do not be stuck on this is what's, whatever mindset you had had. You need to be able to drop it and be flexible for the good of the baby. As far as you are happy and you're settled, baby is growing, baby is thriving that's the most important thing eventually we try to introduce the one that is still you know uh, rolling her eyes at it is still rolling her eyes the one that is managing to eat is eating but at least are they happy are they, are they on the good central do i have peace of mind because it's very stressful to sit down and make amala and they will do everything and they will just tap the bowl in one <laughs> in one swift movement of their hand and the whole thing is on the floor where you could have saved yourself the hassle and giving them a ready meal or something that you know that they would readily eat, especially if you're running, you know, um, if you're running a tight schedule and something. Um, all right, so that's feeding, breastfeeding, whatever works, okay. If they accept a bottle, fine. If you can express, fine. If you want to do directly from sauce and it's not stressing you, you're managing to get your sleep in and you think you can manage that for six months, one year, fine. All I'm saying is that be flexible, accept help, okay. Um, support. I know some people will say, ah, I can never have my mother-in-law stay with me. I would rather not. I don't want anybody touching the children. Again, your own mental health and your sanity, you need to be alive, healthy, growing to actually have the children alive and healthy. So accept help, whatever differences you have. Obviously now there are some major things that, you know, are contract breakers or deal breakers. 
but minor things like we don't get along or minor minor things please push those away and accept the help that you can for the first year i always had someone with me it's a it was a revolving um whatever grandmothers <laughs> within the house and we still had formal child care we still had nanny because um even grandmothers are over 70 they cannot come and die okay as in they've done their bits of raising their children and they are just helping you as grandparents so especially if you have twins um you know if you're dealing with a multiple birth scenario which is what i was dealing with it's it's a bit much to just have you and just one other grandparent if you can get formal help and you can afford it that's fine you know so get all the help you can um so i've talked about friends i've talked about mentors i've talked about health professionals um I had a counselor involved. I was very reluctant about that, a bit worried about the stigma about, oh, I look like I'm not coping. But, you know, she just helped me talk through things and process things in my mind. So that was helpful. Um, I wasn't trying to be superwoman. And I would always um, say that to any new mom or even any mother. You don't even have to be a new mom. Any mother. I think the best thing is that you're there physically, emotionally for your children, even when they um school age you know and that you have the time to tell them oh this is what's happening they can share things with you I think that's more important than you wanting to prove that you can do everything within a home for the longest time as is even before the children came I had cleaners I used to come and clean the house so how much more <laughs> like after I've had twins and then how many adults even in, in the house you know how quickly it can just get dirty so all I'm saying is accept help and contract things out I remember there was a time my mother in law wasn't feeling too well. I was tired. We had someone from church just cook and we paid her. She would make or her air for my my bueno. Just stuck it in the freezer because everybody was tired. We're looking after children in the household. So, so at least if there's food, then we can do the other things. Then we can just be preparing their own food and be helping them, you know. So that, so that was really helpful. Um what else have I not mentioned? I, I have a feeling that there are a few things I haven't said. Oh, yes, sleep. So everybody here has talked about information and books. So I'm not going to go into that anymore. But one of the best things, or, uh, best pieces of advice that I ever received was um, getting my children on a routine. Now, that's not a very Nigerian thing. And I know my mom and my mother-in-law really struggled with that when we insisted that we we're going to do it. But that for me is the singular best decision that I have made reparenting. Um, someone from a friend from church had a baby a month before me. Um, and her mother, who happened to be one of the pastors in church, gave her a book by a white woman called The Contented Little Baby. I think I found the picture online. It's, it looks like this, and it's very big on. I don't know if everybody can see it. Okay, it's 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 too bright. Okay, is that better? Yeah. It's big on routines, what time your baby should sleep. And I remember my mother was like, how, how can you be putting little children on a timetable like this, 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 that, that, that. But I'm a big advocate for it. And if you can, if you can persevere, give it a try. Well before my children were one, they were sleeping through the night. Um, now they run like a clockwork. One of them wakes up at half six, the other one wakes up at half seven. There's a fixed time where they eat the bath. They have their snack now. They've started going to nursery. Everything is fixed. At 10 minutes to eight, we do prayers. We do confession. So big up to Shola for sharing that. We also had the ones that we had been saying from when they were really little in the incubators. And we've now personalized it to them. So to say, I am the head and not the tail. I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. All of that, you know. We do confessions at eight o'clock. Come rain, come shine. Unless, un unless the house is on fire, lights out, and they sleep through the night, yes. Unless one of them is ill, there's no need to go back in or to do anything over or to overnight. They sleep around the clock, 11 hours, 8 to 7. So I'm a big advocate for sleep routines. It takes a while to get it right. It takes a while for the children themselves to be used to it, to sleeping by themselves, to not wanting to be carried, to learn to self-soothe, you know. So if they wake up in the middle of the night, um, now one of them used to have a dummy, and then suck her fingers, so she self suits. The other one doesn't, but he'll just, you know, he'll be chatting in the court by himself, regardless of how long it takes. He'll sing, he'll talk, he will hug his teddy, eventually he will go back to bed. I'll be watching on the monitor, but you really ever need to go in, you know, so that's sleep routines. So um, I'm a huge advocate for sleep routines. Um, so sleep, food, uh, breastfeeding and weaning, whatever they accept, 
just 45, 45, 45. Um, I have two children. And another thing about parenting is knowing and understanding your children. I don't know how God has blessed me with two children who are like polar opposites of each other. Sometimes I look at them and like, why can't you not just be like this one and you to be like this one? But when they were really little, one of them would eat everything, okay? But would not want to sleep. Hug me, carry me, be on my back. The other one was very fussy. Would barely ever eat anything you give her. But my goodness, when it's time to sleep. In fact, if you're carrying her too much, you're disturbing her. Just put me in my coat. And she will sleep through the night like a log. The other one might be screaming the house down. My mother will be like, how can this, can you check her? Is she, she breathing? How can this child be sleeping through this in the same room? <laughs> you know, complete opposite. One of them would eat eggs and enjoy it with a passion. The other one at this, at the smell of an egg, seeing it scrambled, though, they'll say, ah, scramble it, fry it, boil it. The only way she would eat the eggs is, is, is if she doesn't see it. So we then have to, you know, work with putting it in our oats, breaking it into her oats um kind of mashing boiled egg or boiled yolk into her rice all manner of behavior just to make sure that at least she's getting what she needs to get for it from the eggs um and one of them would eat fruits as if they are going out of you know a fashion the other one doesn't even want to see anything there's no biscuit or crackers we're looking too colorful red green she's not going to touch it so you have to be cutting it and hiding the side with her mix to get her to eat but you know, they're two very different children. And I tell all my childcare providers, nannies, nurseries, like they're two very, you know, very different children. I know what each of them is like. And I guess that's parenting, isn't it? And I guess we'll continue for the whole of one's life, you know, as in the peculiarities that you deal with when it comes to your children and knowing them and just accepting it. You know, there's nothing wrong with, I mean, obviously life will be easier for you as a parent if they slept at, um, if there are children who will sleep at a particular time, who will eat anything you give them without one. But I remember one day, was it my mother or an older friend that, that said, you too, you have things that you feel like it's, you know, imagine now if you wake up and you've been dreaming of, oh, a full English breakfast and then somebody brings a mala. I, I used to, you will be angry now. You will throw it away as in, you know, children are also allowed to express choice and allowed to express their emotions and allowed to be fussy. There are fruits you will give me that, you know, I won't eat, so why should I be annoyed that someone doesn't want to, although that one's extreme, I'm not eating any, it's a bit much, but you know, I'm just saying that, you know, children are different and it's okay to allow that personality. I begin to see from a young age, so, you know, don't try to mold them or think, oh, there must be something wrong, so and so and so, and so. I remember then I'll go to the hospital and say, yeah, she's not eating this, she's not eating that, same, but she's growing up, I can give her what she eats, even if it's just five or six things that you can count on the finger, and I know it's on the show banker, so I know. Like sometimes my mother-in-law would try, my mom would say, ah, let's make so and so for that. I'm like, don't even bother for this one. Let me just make the oats and put the, everything you can imagine. The thing, my mom would like, how can, you know, have you tasted this food? I said, there's no need for me to taste it. She needs protein, so the egg is inside. She needs uh, fruits, so there are apples and blackberries inside the same oats. <laughs> as far as she's not seeing it, but she'll eat it all, you know, so don't sweat yourself. Just be flexible, know your children. Um, one of the other pieces of advice I got was to enjoy the early phases. Now you can see why <laughs> I, I sort of rolled my eyes at that. So I said, really enjoy. But now that they are more mobile and moving around and have a bit of an attitude, I can see why, you know, I, I sort of enjoyed the part when they were in hospital because at least other people were taking care of them at a point and I could sleep. You know, when they were smaller, if you put them somewhere, you expect to meet them there, you could dash into the kitchen and quickly, you know, put rice on the fire or do something. And they come back, they've not painted your walls, colors or done things, you know. So if you're a new parent here, planning to, you know, someone who's a new parent, enjoy the faces. Last but not the least, and this might be shaking tables a little bit, but please get the men involved. As part of your don't be a superhuman and superhero complex, does not mean that you originally know all things parenting programmed into your brain from when you were little. The same way you are reading and learning, encourage the men to, to read and learn and to also like get them actively participating in these things. And I say that because not only do they now not feel like they're part of it, but you don't want to create a habit or create an atmosphere where everything rises and falls on mommy. 
for, for the women in the house. It's not healthy for you. Neither is it even healthy for the children who are growing and think that mommy is the one we meet for every single thing and daddy cannot do anything, you know? So there's nothing that says to be able to bat the child. But thankfully, I also have a husband who is very, very, very hands-on. So he'll wake up and he'll bat child one and even bat child two and feed them. And they'll just like, you, you can also be in bed and just rest, you know? But I know that doesn't obtain for many people. And, and I brought that aspect in because I know the expectation. So it looked a bit shocking to people that not only was he willing to do it, but that I was expecting that it be done. So those are two different things. So I think one of the things is if you're lucky to have someone who's hands-on, then that's fine. I'm not saying split it 50-50, but I'm certain that there are things that the men in your life and your partners can do to help your stress as a new parent. Even if it is, as I've said, if you're lucky to live in a place where you have like 24 hour um, electricity, which means you can, you can store breast milk. Um, stored breast milk actually lasts for I think six months or thereabouts. So there's no excuse. Train your baby earlier. I remember then when we were in the universal I see, we're like, are you sure you wanted to have the bottle? Ah, why not have the bottle? Which, how am I going to feed two, only two children? He would have the bottle, you know? So there's nothing that says you sleep through the night and let daddy or whoever um, give express be- breast milk overnight or formula overnight if you're doing mixed feeding. You know, there's nothing that says and that daddy can birth the children or feed the children. We all learn those things. So if, as in, there's nothing in my XX chromosome, which uh, makes me a woman, makes it more... Um, Okay, I'm not going to shake any tables, but I'm just saying that the men can also do as much as they are willing to do. The only thing I, I think that is completely impossible is to birth the children themselves. But there are scenarios where you've seen where mothers have died and the men have stepped up to the game. So it's, I know that is entirely possible. I know sometimes culture, expectation, you know, doesn't help. And then some people just relax. Um, if you live in a place like Nigeria where you have a lot of help, you might be able to get away with this. If you live in a country where even if you have help, um, the expectation is that they'll be asking where is daddy? Like if you're abroad and you have children and you are the ones showing up at school, every PTA meeting, they'll be asking you the questions. On the last note, just to give um, an example of when we're in the neonatal ICU, but there's something they call cares, right? So you go in every six hours and change their little nappies. They had this tiny nappies that were smaller than the size of my palm. Um, and then you put like a little bit of breast milk in cotton buds and then you drop it into their mouth so that they start getting used to the taste of breast milk, even though they were being fed through tubes and whatnot. You know, so it's called cares and you go and do it every six hours. Um, I f- have a feeling that the nurses knew that there were particular ethnicities where it was women always doing it. Okay, so you find that they weren't really pushing the Caucasians, right? But every time we had an Asian or a Pakistani or a black, you'd be hearing, where's the father? No, 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 she's tired. Dad, do it. I remember the first time, I think it was day two or day three, you know, so the, for the first few days, they do the cares themselves because maybe it's a really, really tiny, you know, so many lines, so many things, you know, monitoring and everything. And then after that, they teach you how to do it. You know, so on the first day, they taught me how to do it. And my husband was peeping like this from behind with his hands behind his back. I'm sure they were watching him. By day two, they were like, what's that? <laughs> Move on. <laughs> so I'm just saying that it is very possible. In some places, the expectation is that you step in and you do a lot more to help. So, yes. I think that's about all that I had prepared. You know, get a routine in place, sleep, food, mental health, get as much support as you can, um, involve your partner. That's one of the ways that you can support, not just provision of funds. So, yeah. Thank you so much. That has been, we would, we would say almost exhaustive, but that's been amazing. <laughs> That's been great. Thank you so much for sharing. That's been really, really great. Really, really appreciate that. I was looking for Pastor Kendi to add today, but I can't see him anymore. Okay, so I think you've you've really spoke a lot on it. Um, I've written some points. You, everybody's journey is different. That was a high point. Um, so don't expect your journey or your children to always be like other people. Um, there's no crime with needing help or IVF, that's absolutely fine. Take care of your mental health, relax and be flexible. If the child is growing, child is healthy, child is happy, that is awesome. She's talked about a book, The Contented Little Baby, we're taking note. 
Um, having routines really helped her um, be flexible and know your children and be creative. That's great. And she, she's mentioned a very important point about enjoying the early phase. I think it's important to enjoy every phase of your children's life, which is why I found a bit of people are children going to boarding school, because I think children grow up too fast these days. But yes, um, sometimes the children are, are, are out of diapers ever so, so soon, and it's great to enjoy that phase, um, along with the challenges that come with it. Um, of course, I'm looking from a distance, but yes, I'm sure many people are very excited about having twins after hearing Shell's story. <laughs> Having twins is a, is a big deal where we come from. Everybody, every prayer when you get married is, ah, I want to have twins, I want to have twins. Uh, there is power, there's beans, let us have twins. So I'm sure some of us are still very, very eager. Yeah. And and she's ended on the note of, <laughs> somebody is returning to send that. Thank you, thank you. It's, it's appreciated and accepted with, with grace and with prayer. <laughs> She's ended with encouraging the fathers. Very, very important. <laughs> encouraging the fathers. That's great. Um, I wanted to put Osola as well in the spotlight. I'm looking for her, actually. I wanted you, I think uh, we would let the rest of the speakers give us their final words. I can't see Busola anymore. So I would just let, um... oh, there you are. I can see you now. I'm not that invisible. Don't know why I didn't see you before. It's Pastor Kindly that I'm not sure he's still on the platform. <laughs> Somebody said she would not mind twins as grandchildren, <laughs> as long as she doesn't have to deal with it. <laughs> Someone is saying, let's have more speakers from Nigeria. Yes, we have all of our speakers, except one is um, from Nigeria that are going to be on the Zoom. There's um, another speaker that's going to be on the in-house sessions in August. That is not Nigerian, mother and grandmother. But yes, this has been such an amazing session. Thank you so much to our speakers today, Shola, Busola, and Sheo, and Pastor Kane David, if he's not here. Thank you so, so much for sharing candidly and being very open with us. I think it has helped all of us a lot. Um, and it has refreshed and reminded some of us as well, which is really great. Um, I'm hoping that over time, our health sector in Nigeria will be vibrant enough to have um, all this kind of um, care packages in place in which we can offer support to pregnant women and fathers and you know offer mental health. I know we do it in some way. We are quite culturally supportive in that way. Um, but um, I guess we would need to have better structures in place. It would be quite helpful. Um, so in case she was still thinks of final words is fine. We'll go to you last since you are the last speaker. Let you have a breather and a cup of water. So final words from Busola Festival, followed by Shola and then Shell. Okay, thank you everyone of the speakers. You guys, in fact, we could do this all day. Yeah, very valid points, awesome points. Uh, you know, there's not a word of a lie in everything that has been said, you know. I have just two things to leave with every one of us. I want to touch again on instinct. Um, don't, don't downplay it. You, you, you just never know. When my, when my daughter was born, the first daughter, that night, she couldn't settle. She just couldn't settle. Um, she just wouldn't sleep. And at some point, I just went over to where she was. And I picked her up and I put her on my chest and she slept off. When the doctor came in and saw me, he was, he was blown away. He was like, you're, you're, you're going to be an excellent mom. Thank you. Awesome. And that leads me to my second point. In all my parenting journey, I think I can honestly say that that positive feedback was the only positive feedback that I had. <laughs> Everybody is eager to tell you, why are you coming ahead? Can't you see? Why are you, why are you not coming ahead? Can't you see? Why are you backing out like this? Are you blind? Why didn't you back out? Everybody and their uncle will give you negative feedback. Mm -hmm. Very few people will tell you, you've got this. You're doing a good job. And I, want, I just want every one of us to consciously make that note in your mind. 
to tell yourself. You may not be fortunate enough to hear it from someone else, but <laughs> prepare. Prepare your own mechanism for encouraging yourself because the truth of the matter is God wouldn't give you that child to punish the child. God has already given everything that child needs to both you and your partner. So just keep telling yourself, I've got this. I'm doing a good job. What a great mom I am. What a great dad I am. We are blessed. When you make those positive affirmations, you help your own self, your mental health, and you, your karma. And babies pick up on your emotional state. So please, it, it sounds like a very tiny thing, but I, I really encourage us to try it. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. That's really appreciated. I used to, I used to say it on the, I said it once on the relationship group that have used every opportunity to tell your spouse that you are doing well. So the same way, there are so many people that need to hear that, that they are doing well, that they are working hard, that they're being a great mom. Um, of course, we can all do better. Of course, there's room for improvement, but at the stages we are, every little word of encouragement counts and it does help. Some people don't hear it often. Off. and we appreciate it most from the people that are closest to us like our spouse and our parents or people and surprisingly it's people that are not close to us that sometimes give it actually people that are distant and are watching us from a distance but it means a lot um to hear that and to say to ourselves yes you should encourage yourself even if nobody encourages you even the Adama lizard is encouraging himself so many times <laughs> not doing not doing ferocious yes i'm all right i'm doing okay i'm fantastic uh -huh. So continue. <laughs> so thank you very much for hinting that. Um, and I appreciate Sheru and all the people that mentioned and Pastor Kenny that mentioned about the men. Um, men can be as nervous as their wives with bringing up children or having babies, especially because there's not very much they can do from the outside. But of course, once the baby is born, over to you, move forward. <laughs> as somebody said in the chat, that is move forward. Um, I know a particular gentleman who also happens to be a clergyman. I said, why do children love their mothers so much? Is it not because they will breastfeed them, they will give them food, they will give them this, they will talk to them, that he, as far as he's concerned, once his children come, he's going to be doing everything because he wants his children to really, really love him. <laughs> And he did, he did exactly that. He was changing their first, giving them food, taking them to school. Um, yes, and the children are really close to him as well. So of course, the, the investment pays off, investing time in your children, even in your friendships and people, it pays off eventually. Um, and there will come a time that the reward, the reward will definitely come and be visible. So it's great. Um, yes, Shola, final words, thank you. Hi everyone, thanks to me once again and um, to Sheung for sharing that um, beautiful experience. So now the baby center I talked about, um, I can't over, uh, uh, I'm so passionate about baby center, that's the logo, oh please. It made life so simple for me that every week I knew, and the good thing was that for one of my children, ticked all the boxes, all the boxes at that same time. For the second one, is either she's doing something early or she's doing something late, but I can't advise, but this just puts your mind at rest, okay? So that's the logo. If you want to download the app, if you want to register, once your pregnancy test is positive, because I think it goes by your pregnancy um, test date and then it starts giving you um, weekly details. So secondly, yeah, um, we've talked about support, but be among somebody who will encourage a new mom, okay? Just make it intentional. Some of them don't ask for help because they think they've got it all or because they think you're gonna say no. Offer support. I've had friends that, church members, oh, I don't mind, just one, one hour or two hours with your baby and then you can do whatever you want to do. Just offer that support, okay? If they say no, that's okay. And some of them say no because they don't know how they feel, but. Let it be genuine if you're willing to help. Um, and um, thirdly, I think we talked about mental health but briefly. Both of my pregnancies, I had postnatal blues. So again, that's an emotional state where you don't know what's happening. You just feel overwhelmed and you're just crying. And I couldn't really explain it. I was just crying. And that's a time to speak with somebody, take a break, like 
when I have it, I had an episode where I had to just put the baby in the cot and I just walked away because I just needed, I needed my mental, mental health back. So if that's the case, if you feel that emotionally you're disturbed and you're worried as well, please take a break. Talk to somebody who you feel can encourage or who you feel can um, assign you to um, for, um, for the counseling. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very, very much. I know you're passionate about the baby center. Maybe you have shares there. You have not told us yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but yes, it's great to know that we have veterans in the house that we can ask for advice. Thank you so much for being on the platform. And big thank you to everybody who's left comments for us. Dola Paul, um, Bashi, Sukomi and Jory, Sister Sophie, Sister Busola, Tudu Alalade, Nike Koya. Um, Tommy C, Muji Adiniji, thank you so much, um, Mr. Adiwale, um, thank you so much, everyone, Prof. Aedu, thanks a lot. Um, Faith Oluwoyo, um, thank you for your comments. Stanike Koya, thank you very much. Mr. Adibusola, thank you. I should have mentioned your name twice now because <laughs> you've been contributing. Thank you so much. Now um, we'll take final words from um, Dr. Ujai. Okay, so final words for me, just to build on what Basola said earlier in terms of um, in terms of affirmation and how you begin to see your role. At some point, I had to come to the realization that parenting is service and is not service unto myself or even service unto the children. As I've said before, everything I'm sharing is from a Christian perspective. So that colors how I see things obviously, but it's service unto God. And I had to come to that place because there was a point where I was beginning to feel like, mm, like nobody really appreciates me so much. They just expect that mommy, even the child said is like, yeah, mommy, mommy, mommy. Even my husband just expects that mommy will do it. And I, and I remember that God then showed me the scripture from um, the Passion Translation it was Hebrews 6.10. And it says that for God is not unfair. How can he forget the beautiful work you have done for him? says he remembers the love you demonstrate as you continually serve his beloved ones for the glory of his name. So every time I'm looking after my children and I'm putting them first and I'm sacrificing, I don't think motherhood or parenting should be martyrdom or I should be suffering. But every time where I put them first or I have put you know, their needs ahead of mine or I, I have deprived myself of sleep to care and love them in service unto God. You know, so my reward is not from my husband, neither is it from my children. Is from God. So that is what gingers me sometimes when I'm feeling a bit low and a bit down. So I think it's just nice to remind everybody, if you see as I see, that this work you're doing is unto God. The children are his, is service to God. And don't look unto them. They will love you. They will honor you. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 31 that um, the children arise and call her blessed. But reward is from God. Mm, that is fantastic. For those that don't know, Shemu used to be one of the pastors in my fellowship, very deep lady. We come back a long way. When I first moved to the UK uh, and I was about to write an exam, she used to call me all the time. Hey, how are you doing? How is the exam? How is the interview? In my, at one point I was saying, this girl, why are you on my case? Did they send you to me? <laughs> But she, she was really, really supportive in that first day I came and I appreciate it even in hindsight now. Thank You're you welcome. so much for those comments. That is amazing. Um, our you. children, even we ourselves, our lives is on loan. Our own lives <laughs> is on loan. It's not our own. They just gave us, they borrowed us this breath that every time we have breath, we have another opportunity to make impact, to live our purpose. And same way our children are a gift from God. And if we have opportunity to interact with children, whether we give them a cup of water in the name of God, God, our reward and, and God rewards handsomely. So that is such a great perspective that you've shared with us. And I'm sure it will ginger all of us to be awesome parents. <laughs> We were awesome parents before. You all are doing well. It's fantastic to have all of us on Thank the you. platform. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, for information of everybody, there's no speaker that has collected any money from me for coming to speak on this platform. They have all come out of the goodness of their hearts and only God would reward them. You are sowing into the future. And I really, really thank you all. 
thank you everyone on the platform and um, we will end with our final words i don't know whether you know our final words but i'll say it again uh, if someone likes they can type it in the chat does anybody know the, our final words i'm sure those on the whatsapp group know it who is going to type it in the who knows children that God has given. yes mm -hmm. mommy I do. you want to share it with us Yes, <laughs> the children that God has given oh, yes. wonders. Yes, I and the children God has I given me, given we me. are yes. for signs yes. and wonders, yes. and that is wonders. that is that is um, deliberate because it's not just all about children. Some people is all about children. It's not all about children. It starts from you. You cannot give what you don't have. So I and the children God has given me, which is reflecting where the children are coming from and who they are who they are going back to, because no matter how long we live, we are not going, by the grace of God, we are not going to live longer than our children. So it's mm -hmm. I and the children that God mm -hmm. has given me. We are for signs and wonders. As long as we have breath, we are for signs and wonders. Thank you so much, everybody. Mm -hmm.